Hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about doing a cure. A cure is a undergraduate research project and uh, it's been something we've done for two semesters now in CSI 1 and it's been really really successful. The Dean of the college um, has given a lot of props to the students that have worked on the, the cures and um, uh, students have really seemed to enjoy it, learned a lot, so let's get into it. The uh, acronym CURE stands for a course-based undergraduate research experience, and it is something called a high-impact practice. My cat is staring at my own video on the screen here. She is fascinated by the fact I'm in two places at once. Um, so it is a high-impact practice. Uh, high-impact practice is a um, teaching method that has been demonstrated to improve learning outcomes in, in you guys. And so it is a, uh, it's a really neat process. And so um, it's going to be part of your capstone portfolio uh, to get GE credit for this class. So what you're going to be doing is research. Okay. And the question is research on what? And uh, my face is going to be like this. So uh, it could be any open question. And, and if that's vague, let me explain a little bit. So anything that people are currently researching, curious about, it's not settled, um, is fair game. But it just has to be on the topic of technology and society somewhere. And if that means there's a lot of topics, Yes, there are. I mean, that's a huge, broad number of possibilities. Uh, so everything from like self-driving cars to in vitro fertilization to um, the intelligence of League of Legends players are all possible, you know, topics for this class. It just has to be related in some way to technology and the intersection of technology and society. So um, I want you to like kind of start percolating ideas in your head, like. You know, there's this topic that I've been interested in for a while. I want to dig into it a little bit. And I want you to pick something that, uh, like, kind of speaks to you a little bit. Like, it's something you're personally interested in. Because you're going to be spending a lot of time on this topic over the semester. And if you hate the topic, then it's not going to be very fun. And you're not going to be very motivated to work on it. But if it's something that really interests you, like, um, I don't know detection of chat GPT essays, then you will be a lot more motivated uh, when you're doing your research. So, uh, to, to, to do, uh, social credit, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of topics, uh, search engine bias, uh, AI generated art. Um, uh, like, like I said, there's just a huge number of possible topics in the cats. One thing I do want, though, is no duplicates. Uh, the first time I did this, like, I had 30 people pick the same topic, and that's pretty boring. Um, at the end of the semester, we're going to do a poster session, and if 30 people all do the same topic, then that's a very boring poster session. So I'm having a rule where each topic can be picked, once that's it and so i'm going to post on to canvas uh, a google form sign up kind of thing where you can put your name down and the topic you want and i just go through them top to bottom first come first served and if somebody later on wants to do your topic sorry it's been taken pick another one and this process can take a while uh, especially some students that are really slow on picking topics, you know, when they're trying to pick a topic that 120 other students haven't picked yet, um, can kind of take a while. So I recommend jumping on it as quickly as possible, or just come up with a interesting idea that is kind of unusual. Like, um, one of the winners last year was studying, uh, the intelligence of bilingual people, something like that. So, uh, basically, giving tests to people that were raised bilingual versus people that were raised in a single language family. 
and IQ testing them and things like that. Um, nobody else took that topic, so it was very easy to be like, check. Yep. Sounds good. Um, you also can find, like, if you want to do, like, a lot of people want to do, like, Twitter, like, you know, what are the effects of Twitter after Elon took over? Um, you can find different, like, parts of that that uh, are different from other people. So, uh, you know, there's a widespread claim that, you know, hate speech uh, went up on Twitter after Elon took over. Uh, another person could study the amount of advertising on it. Uh, another person could study if the topics on Twitter changed. You know, there's there's different facets of every topic. And you can just kind of find your own niche on that. And if your topics are uh, like not related to technology and science, I'll reject them. Like if you want to study, I don't know, if Q-tips have gone downhill. I'm just staring at the first thing that I see on my, uh, you know, table here. Uh, are cats more intelligent than dogs? Like that's not, you know what I mean? It's not like not really um, technology related. So um, you have to find some, you know, intersection of technology and science and let's all reject topics that aren't on that. This is a computer science class. And so we do something, you know, related to, to it. Um, we had several last year that were on, um, early childhood education and technology. It's like people using tablets to um, educate, like not educate, like babysit their kids. Like, hey, youngster, here's a tablet. Go not bother me, you know? And so there's a lot of different facets of that you can study. And so we ended up getting a bunch of those, but they're all different, you know? And so it was cool to see them talk to each other at the poster session because like, oh, I studied something related to this too. What did you find? And that's a cool experience, you know, especially because traditionally speaking, freshmen and sophomores, which is most of the class here in CSI 1, don't do research. Um, research is traditionally considered to be an activity for grad school students, sometimes seniors, maybe juniors. Um, it's, it's mostly the grad students that actually do research. And doing something as a freshman is like mind blowing to um, a lot of the the college professors here and stuff like that. And so it's a it's a really good experience. For it. It's 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 going to be it's going to give you a taste for what research is like. We're not doing like a full research class here because we got other stuff to learn in critical thinking. But it'll it'll hopefully whet your appetite for like what the research process is like. You'll get to go to a research like um, poster session, which is kind of cool and walk around and talk to people and see other people's research, which is a big part of like academic um, activity. So like if you, you know, go on and study uh, like my wife did the, the impact of um, stress on blood coagulability, um, you go to like the American psychosomatic society and, all these posters and there's like oh my oh look at this there's like five or six others that are on stress the effects of stress you know and you like talk to the authors like oh, i read your paper and, and that those interactions is like a big part of like how research works in america and especially as college freshmen and sophomores none of that is it's like a completely different world you guys and so this project is going to like give you like that little taste of like what the research world is like and how it's like kind of fun and um, hopefully like encourage you to do research later on in your life. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're gonna do is you're gonna pick your topic and I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna kick out any that are duplicates or aren't related to technology and society. Um, then we are going to go through and refine the topics. And so, Basically, you're going to generate um, a research question. And it can't just be like, you know, is technology bad for kids? That's a bad research question. I mean, it's way, I mean, it's way too broad. I mean, maybe at like the absolute highest levels of analysis. No, like what, what, that's too, like, what are you, what do you, what technology, right? What, what kids are we talking about? Um, are we talking about tablets? Are we talking about phones? Are we talking about 
video games. We're talking about computers. Uh, and then on a computer, what software? Um, what age range? What do we mean by good? Uh, are we talking about grades? Are we talking about developing ADHD? Are we talking about, um, you know, the learning specific like math skills or English skills or hand-eye coordination? Like what, like, is technology bad for kids is just a bad topic. What you need is to make your topic smart. And we're going to, you know, you don't have to do this right now. All you have to do right now is just pick a topic. That's your only, it's your only task right now for this. We're going to do this after everybody gets their topic, then we're going to refine them and we're going to make the topics smart. And so smart is an acronym standing for Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. Uh, so specific would be like you'll you'll hear like when I come back to you, I'm going to be like, when you say technology is bad for kids, you know what technology? What do you mean by bad? What age range for kids? Right. And so students will come back and be like, I'm going to study the effects of tablets on children in the range of two to four years old. And by bad, I'm talking about their emotional regulation. Cool. So that's specific, right? Like, like I'll just ask you, like, what do you mean by, you know, this? It, like, you have to give me a very specific number because children do wrong. Like, a, a zero-year-old is very different from an 18-year-old. You know what I mean? Like, a two-year-old is very different from a sixth grader. Like, there's a huge, massive, like, amount of growth in kids. And so if you just say kids, like, you know, it's way too, way too broad usually. Okay. Measurable. So your topic has to be something that you can quantify. And, um, usually this means being able to get numbers. Not always. Like you can do like interviews with people and do, you know, there's quantitative numbers and qualitative just like words and feelings and like you can do both kinds of analysis. I would recommend though having something where you can actually get a number and be like, all right, I'm going to be studying the effects of the Oregon Trail video game, which you guys, if you don't know what it is, you know, look it up. It's an old video game that's been re-released a bunch of times. I'm going to study the effect of the Oregon Trail video game on American history, uh, content knowledge in fifth graders. And uh, I'm going to, to make it measurable, I'm going to give them a pretest, and, uh, then, at, then they're going to play Oregon Trail and I'm going to give them a post test on the topic of westward expansion in America. That's measurable. Now you might be like, wait, am I going to have to make a pretest and post this? No, nah, nah, nah. we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, but you, you can find other people who have done this. Like right? all I'm saying is that <clears throat> for this project, it's really nice to be able to get a number where you can be like beforehand, they scored 30%. After they played Oregon Trail, they got a 70%. So that was a 40%, you know, difference. Um, so measurable means, you know, it's something you can actually assess. Okay. Achievable. <clears throat> uh, students can, for example, um, go up. You know, like if, if all of them were testing 100% prior to the test, can't show any growth. So, um, yeah, for Oregon Trail, um, you know, make sure that, you know, the test is something that's at their reading level, for example. Uh, realistic <coughs> means that you can actually achieve your, um, <coughs> your goal here uh, by the end of the semester. Uh, and this relates to time bound as well. Um, so time bound means like over what period of time are we talking about? Like we're going to have the students play Oregon Trail for one hour or something like that. But realistic uh, and time bound also go together in terms of like how long you're going to spend on this project. So a very common thing that I got last year, probably from students who use ChatGPT to generate their topics, was we are going to follow students over the next three years. I was like, no. You are not following students over the next three years. You have until December to finish this project. So uh, you are not going to do a 20-year longitudinal study following students as they use technology up through the K-12 
It's, no, no, you have till December. Okay. And so for it to be realistic, this has to be something you can do by December. Okay. And uh, time down, like I said, plays into that because like you can't study them for five years. You have till December, which is three months away, right? Like you can't, you know, don't, don't do any of these broad, you know, brown earth shaking studies that no, do something simple. You know, like uh, like going back to my Oregon Trail example. You could get 10 kids. That's realistic, right? You can get 10 kids, have them play video game for an hour, test them before and after. That's realistic. That's doable. Uh, another area where it's not realistic is that <clears throat> I have students, and again, a lot of them, I think, use ChatGPT to generate their topic. It's a terrible idea for a number of reasons. Uh, they said, we will study 10,000 students. I'm like, no. Nah. You are not getting 10,000 students to play Oregon Trail. You know what I mean? Like, it's not realistic. It's, it's just not. I'm not looking for you guys to get a Nobel Prize. Okay. Is this is this study size of eight people too small to be published in Nature Magazine? Yeah, it's too small. I'm not looking for you guys to get published in Nature Magazine. I want you guys to get a taste for what research is like. And so just doing an experiment with a few kids, you know, and I, I don't even want to say that even that sounds horrible. Like for, for most of these projects, you don't even have to do an experiment. Okay. Because like, then you get into like IRB issues and things like that. Um, what you actually can do is look at other people's research. Okay. So you don't even have to do the research yourself. Like I said, like when I was talking about like having students play Oregon Trail, like, you probably don't even have to do that yourself. You can find somebody else who did it and present the research. And so what you can do for this topic is just summarize the research other people have done. And that's good enough for this class. This is CSI 1. You're not trying to get a Nobel Prize. You're not trying to do a massive study. Just take it easy. It's not, it's not supposed to murder you guys. It's supposed to be fun and give you a taste, like a little wetting of the appetite for, for what research is so, uh, so most of you guys are going to do a literature review. Uh, well, all of you guys are do literature review. For most of you guys, that's all you're going to do. You're not going to run an experiment yourself. You can, and we'll talk about that. But for most of you, you're actually not going to run these experiments yourself. You're going to find people that have done experiments and summarize the data. Okay. And so in, in science, we call this a, a meta study, a study that is based on other studies. And uh, it's a lot easier <clears throat> to report the results of experiments uh, than it is to do it yourself. So um, <clears throat> after you've got your topic chosen, after you've got the thing refined, so you have a good research question, <clears throat> then you're actually going to begin your project. And you are going to do a literature review. You're going to find three to 10 sources on your topic. So if you're studying the uh, effects of bilingual uh, education on intelligence, I keep using these intelligence things. It doesn't have to be, <laughs> the problem with giving examples is that students latch onto it and then they all pick it. And so by talking about bilingual education, you know, there's odds are I'm gonna get like 30 people wanting to study, you know, the effects of bilingual education on intelligence. And, um, that's just a problem with giving examples is it seems like, yeah, that sounds good to me. I'll do that. No, no, pick your own, pick, pick your own topic. Okay. And, uh, and so what you're going to do is, uh, but I'm just going to use the bilingual as an example. You're going to find three to 10 examples, uh, in the literature of people who have studied this topic and you're going to make sure they're relevant. You're going to make sure they're credible. Uh, you're going to assess their bias. For example, if the studies are coming from an institute that does bilingual education, they're they're probably going to be very pro bilingual education, right? So you have to you have to assess all these things, and um, and the quality, like you know, what is their study design a double blinded randomized control trial? In social sciences, they're usually not. Um, you know, people usually know if they're getting bilingual education or not. You know, it's like, well, I don't know if I'm in the experimental group. Are they talking to you in English? Or two languages? 
Yeah. Like you can't hide the fact. You can't hide the fact. You know, <laughs> little Timmy is in a bilingual. Class. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Like, um, you know, so in social sciences, like you know, the, humans are not like you know chemicals in a test tube that you know, like that just you know, like you know, it, in social sciences, it's it's a lot more rare to actually find a good high quality double blind randomized control trial. You find that more in the harder sciences. Um, like if you're going to do a drug trial, then yeah, you don't tell people, you know, are you getting the the real drug or are you getting the fake placebo? Uh, but, you know, if you're doing bilingual education, there's no way to hide the fact. You're either getting bilingual education or monolingual. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you're going to be given several weeks to do the literature review. You've got to find a bunch of sources on your topic, three to ten. Uh, you're going to assess them on these four different points here. Submit them to me. I'm going to look them over and make sure that uh, everything looks good on that front. Uh, you will post this on a Canvas discussion forum. You're going to peer review two other people's and look at the references and make sure that their references are relevant, credible, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to, uh, you know, basically double check other people's work, which is part of science. Like I do peer review uh, every year. Do I get paid for it? No. Why do I do it? I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess because it, I, I guess because doing peer review like keeps me up to date with the latest research and stuff like that. Um, really though, it's just because it's my responsibility, arguably, maybe not. I don't know. Um, Kitty. Did you come here to talk about double blind randomized control trials, Julia? Yeah. Meow. You want to say hi to my students? Julia? Is that door too interesting to you? Um, so my daughter wants to do a, uh, a science project on uh, cats. Because we have a cat now. So, um, yeah. So what you do when you do the peer review of the other students is you uh, are getting um, experience doing peer review. Peer review is when scientists look at other scientists' papers and read them over and make sure they're following proper scientific methodology and um, looking at their literature review and making sure they did their uh, their job, you know, uh, citing papers that should be cited, um, having adequate references, Things like that, like you guys are just gonna get a little, a little feel for it. Again, all of this stuff is just to kind of like give you a little taste of what the science world is like. Come on, cat. Are you leaving me? Okay, then you're gonna make a research poster. Okay, and so this is, we're fast forwarding now towards the end of the semester. So at the end of the semester, the big thing is you're gonna make a research poster. I have some examples that I'll show you in a second. And the research posters uh, are like your final like um, presentation basically. Like this is where you're really being assessed on your work and uh, uh, it's worth more points than the other sections. Um, that reason, some students wait to the last minute and really half-ass a research poster, which I don't recommend because the dean of the college comes in and he looks at every single one of them. Like, we were expecting him the first time we did this a year ago. Uh, we were expecting him to just kind of come in and just be like, oh, hi, you know, nice to meet you guys. But he was like, oh, this is really interesting. And he actually, like, walked around. He's like, this is really cool. And he's like talking to all the students and looking at their posters. And so um, put some time and effort into it, you know, because you're, you're probably going to get quizzed on it by, you know, the dean of the college, the 
um, department chair of the computer science department always comes to it and talks to people and gets really interested in stuff like that. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll run you through making the research poster later on. But basically, let me show you guys what this looks like. Um, so th these examples here are like what um, like real scientists make. So if you go to a poster session for like a actual academic research conference, they have these like lay flat posters. They have different sections on them and all of them feel like this kind of like this is kind of the, the generic kind of look to a research poster. Um, your stuff's going to go onto an easel and um, we might have some poster like foam board posters for you guys. I'll have to double check on that. Um, if not, Dollar Tree is just around the corner and you can get two posters for $1. So um, I apologize for making you spend 50 cents. So here's an example. Um, so you can see here, <clears throat> we don't need, you know, you to go to like FedEx office and spend $300 professionally printing and laminating a poster. Now, this, this is fine. Okay. We're, we're not, uh, again, expect you guys to get the Nobel Prize or any of this stuff. Just, this is fine. Now, on the right-hand side there, that one's like, yeah, like a little bit too little. Uh, but th this one here. So what we have here is we have the research question, front and center. Uh, do League of Legends players have a higher IQ than those that don't play it? got a hypothesis, what he's expecting to find. Uh, on the right, upper right, he talks about his methods. This is how he went about doing it. He's got his findings there, his conclusion. The flow of the poster is a little bit weird, like I would probably lay it out differently myself. Uh, and then he's got his, uh, he's got some graphs and tables, you know, showing his results. Um, and then his references, you know, the works done in the bottom right corner. And that's it, he got an A. Like, like you can tell, he didn't, you know, put a lot of effort into, <laughs> you know, like it's just a, it's a Sharpie, right? Like he, he just took a permanent marker and got a 50 cent Dollar Tree poster board. And, you know, it's whatever, like, you know, this is fine. Um, like you can see uh, over here behind my head, you know, like there's another one over here. I mean, just, you know, print out some things, get some construction paper, glue it on. You got some pictures on here to make it look nice. You know, like, again, it, like you don't have to have like holograms and you know, like $300 laminated stuff. Like this is fine. Like, it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic at all here. Like this is, uh, I, I love this one, which is why you've heard me probably mention it several times in class. Okay. So, uh, uh, children in tech, um, what are the attention and concentration effects? You see how this is smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, I know. Um, it's specific. What are the attention and concentration effects of tablet usage among kids age one to five? Do you see that? What age range, right? What kind of technology? What do we mean by bad? You know, and and so she said she focused on attention and concentration. Use of tablets, ages one to five. Done. Right? She presents her sources. She didn't do any experiments herself. This guy, he actually did some experiments himself. Like I said, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, he actually IQ tested, uh, what is that, like 10 of his friends, something like that. So again, population, sample size, very small. Not really valid, but it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. You don't have to do N equals a thousand. You don't have to do these mega studies. You, you don't have any funding for it. This is just a side project. You know what I mean? Ken's fine. It, it really is. And so he IQ tested 10 of his friends and got the average. You can see the results here uh, on the little bar chart, the top left bar chart there. You know, and that's the IQ results of his 10 different friends. Five played league, five did not play league. The results are not very valid. But again, we're just trying to give you that feel, that taste of like what research is like. Okay. And for this one, she didn't do any research at all. And that's fine. Like probably two thirds of all 
students, three quarters, somewhere in that range, don't do original, like they don't IQ test their friends. They just find papers and they're done. Okay, so the literature review is really, you know, the big step where they gather, she gathered here five different uh, sources, quoted them, summarized the results on this table here, um, <clears throat> uh, brought it all together. What she found was, uh, contrary to what she expected, tablets do not have um, a negative effect on students' ADHD. And that was surprising to her. She was expecting to find one result and one of the cool things about science is like she's like yeah um after looking at the data like it doesn't seem like it negatively impacts adhd in young kids so um yeah i asked her i'm like you know would you limit screen time you know if you had if you had to get you know she's like yeah probably but like you know i was coming into this expecting to see you know people that babysit with tablets um giving their kids adhd basically and the research doesn't show it. So I changed my mind. I was like, that's science. That's amazing. You know, it's cool. Uh, do our smartphones listen to our every move? So here, uh, let me get my head out of the way. That's the dean of the college or the dean of our school or whatever. There's different divisions. Fresno State. That's the dean right there. That's the head of computer science right there. And like I said, they just walk around and they just talk to people. And, and you can see Alex is loving it. Alex is the head of the computer science department. He's got a big smile on his face. He's digging it. He's loving it. Uh, the dean over here, you can see he's got a big smile on his face. He's like, yeah, this is so cool. You know, and so hopefully you guys will get like this fire of like, oh man, you know, this is, you know, cool stuff, you know, because the, the, the administration of your school is actually really fired up for this project that you guys are doing. And like they, they, they spend hundreds of dollars like buying you guys food. Uh, this is in the residential dining hall, and they had a banquet in the other direction that had sandwiches and cookies and stuff like that on it. Um, so they're, you know, the school loves it. And I think um, hopefully that should motivate you. You know, like when when school administrators are like, so cool. like, you know, hopefully that should get your, you know, fires going a little bit. And so her project is do our smartphones listen to our every move? So she did a um, study with a sample size of, I think, two. I think she did the study twice. And all she did was she took her phone and she put it on the table and she had a conversation with a friend uh, about a topic she had never talked about before. You know, um, so I don't know. Uh, let me see something in this area here. Uh, chapstick. Okay. Hi. Sally, do you like chapstick? Why, yes, I do. Chapstick is really cool. You know, and your phone's just sitting here. Your phone appears to be off. But is it listening to you? You know? And so they're just saying, man, I could really go for some chapstick right now. Oh, I would love to buy chapstick as well. My lips are really chapped and I need chapstick. And then what they do... After they, you know, talk about it, then they're like, "All right, let's uh, let's go on to uh, Facebook here and uh, do, 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 and start looking at ads on Facebook." Berkeley uh, Chief Technology Officer Program, which, I mean, given the fact I've been talking about technology, maybe they are listening to me. Let's see here. Next ad. Next ad. Next ad. Uh, Top Heroes Kingdom Saga video game ad. Uh, Next ad, Adafruit Electronics, again, technology related. More electronics ads. Next ad, VS Code. Yeah, so it's all technology stuff, so I can't really. Chief Information Officer ad. So that's the experiment, right? And so they just sit there and they just talk, you know, with their friend twice. They did this twice and and saw if ads appeared, you know, kind of cool. Uh, you can see the poster is pretty minimal. I would probably put a little bit more effort into it than this. You know what I mean? Like, 
punch it up a little bit. But it's fun. It's cool. Um, so coming back to the last part here, you can do your own research like that, where you're like, you know, like, are, is my cell phone listening to me? It appears to be off, but I'm going to talk about Chapstick and see if, you know, I start getting ads for Chapstick on here. Uh, the other day I was talking to a friend of mine about uh, Dead Poets Society, a Robin Williams movie that came out 30 years ago. And then on Facebook, I got an ad for Oh Captain, My Captain, which is a poem that appears in the Dead Poets Society. And I was just like, Hmm, it's very suspicious. Very suspicious timing indeed, Facebook. To run an ad for Oh Captain, My Captain right after I'm talking to a friend about it. Hmm. So that's doing your own research. You don't have to do this. It's optional. You guys understand? What is mandatory is picking a topic, doing literature review, and a poster. But a lot of students get fired up and they're like, I want to do an experiment. I want to do my own research. You can. It's cool. It's optional. All right. And so you can IQ test your friends. You can uh, you know, see if Mark Zuckerberg is listening to you while the phone's off, right? You can do that. And so um, uh, my main advice for you, if you're going to do that, is to keep it, like, don't go overboard, right? Ten, the guy tested 10 of his friends for League of Legends. You don't, like, is the results valid? Probably not. Are you going to get published in Nature Magazine? Probably not. It's not important. Do you guys understand? If you're going to do research, just keep it, you know, keep it very modest. It doesn't have to be big. And so um, one student was studying the ethical systems of ChatGPT. It would ask ChatGPT ethics questions, like when is it right to, you know, da 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 And it was trying to assess, is ChatGPT giving responses from Kantian ethics or utilitarianism or virtue ethics, you know, and he was like asking questions and seeing which moral system ChatGPT was using. And that's a cool experiment. It really is. He, and, you know, 10 questions, it's fine. It doesn't, like, it's less than an hour of work, you know, and it's really an interesting topic. Like, how are these AI systems making moral decisions, right? Like, like I want to, like, I personally want to know this myself, like, you know, if we're going to be offloading more and more of our responsibilities to AI, how are they making their moral decisions? Are they making it using deontology, divine command theory, natural rights? Like, what are you, you know, how are they doing that? This might have an impact on the world. Okay, so that's the presentation for today. Hope you guys are fired up over that. Uh, the first thing, again, is just picking your topic. Okay, so I'm going to put this up on Canvas right now. You're going to pick a topic. And first come, first serve, um, if I reject your topic saying it's been done already, pick another one and or uh, refine it, find a different facet of your topic um, that the other person hasn't done. And you oftentimes might have to have a back and forth with me several times. Uh, the due date for this is going to be in a week or so. Uh, but in reality, uh, it kind of stretches on to like two weeks because a lot of people pick duplicates and it just takes a while to, to resolve them. Okay. So that's it for today, guys. Uh, thanks for watching this video. I hope you're fired up about this. It's, it's been, uh, we've done this twice now and both times it's just been a really great experience for students. Um, it's not supposed to kill you. It's not supposed to murder you. It's not supposed to eat up all of your time. Um, it's supposed to just be a fun little taste of what the research world is like. And then you might be like, oh man, this, this is kind of fun. Maybe I want to do research as a career. Maybe, uh, you know, when you're at that poster session, like, oh man, these free sandwiches are great. I would love to go to places where they have free sandwiches. I don't know. Um, but no, that feeling of just like walking around and seeing the research other people do and having people ask you questions about your research, like it's kind of fun. And, and these academic sort of conferences go on all over the world and to college freshmen and sophomores, it's basically invisible to them. So this is kind of like pulling the curtain back on like how colleges work, universities work, um, kind of at the higher level of existence, not the, oh, I've got a cram for a midterm level. But like our four-year college system really is there to do research. Um, 
community colleges are there to educate. Um, but like a big part of like the four year system is pushing the frontiers of human knowledge, right? And teaching is kind of a side gig. And that's not really very apparent to most students, right? You think, oh, I'm here to do high school 2.0. That, that's your perspective, but in reality, you know, colleges are a big part of college existence is tied in with doing research, getting grant money, um, studying a topic, things like that. And by and large, college freshmen and sophomores just don't see any of that. So hopefully this will be cool for you. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, the last two semesters have gone swimmingly. I expect this one to, to do so as well. And I can't wait to see what topics you guys come up with. Julia, you want to say goodbye to people? Kitty. You want to say goodbye to my students? Nope. She wants to sleep. Okay, see you guys.